Okay, brilliant. Okay, guys, can everybody can everybody see that okay? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Okay. And can you hear me okay as well? Yeah. So there's two just I've got two of you that are after joining now uh, on the live on the live uh, stream. I'll just I'll just wait a moment. There's three there now. So I'll just say hi, so just so, so I can see who's there. Okay, there's four. Five, so I'll just say five guys. I'm in a knot here with all the all the leads and so on. Okay, okay, Sheilan, I'll just get started here. Is that okay? Okay, brilliant. Okay, so I'm just 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 conscious. Yeah, your question. So I want to make sure that you're definitely you're definitely there. Okay, right. So let's just keep in mind, yeah, that what we have, and I and I keep and I, in in the previous sessions, I've sort of harped on about this, yeah is that we have always got some population okay so there's some population that we're interested in okay uh, and look it, it, it could be any it could be anything at all but more more importantly there's there's more than likely more than one variable that we're interested in there's probably many variables that we're interested in and trying to uh try to i suppose let's say characterize the relationships between them variables but let's just concentrate on one single variable and let's say it's the let's say it's the the spending behavior of 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 Irish people over a typical weekend, and that's what we're trying to understand. Well, that particular population, and I always keep going back to this, that population, if, if we could add, ask that question to everybody in the population, and we'd have a whole set of values, a whole set of spends, yeah, that, that people in Ireland uh, have, 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 let's say, spent over particular weekends. But more importantly, we can summarize that particular data set. We can summarize it down into, into specific values, yeah? So the population itself has an average, yeah. Okay, it has an average mu, and it also has a variance uh, sigma squared. And if you want to look at the variance also from a standard deviation perspective, it has a standard deviation. Yeah, there's many, there's many statistics, yeah, or there's many parameters, I should say, yeah. There's many parameters associated with the population, associated uh, with uh, the population. And just to list some off, it could be the mean that we're interested in it could be the variance that we're interested in it could be the standard deviation that we're interested in uh, it could be the skewness of the population that we're interested in it could be the kurtosis just different ways that we can summarize the population it doesn't have to be them it could be in regression models it could be coefficients it could be coefficients in regression models uh, it could be correlations between variables uh, there's many, many different ways and many statistics or parameters that are associated with populations themselves. Yeah. Okay. But let's just concentrate on one of them, which is trying to understand the mean mu that's associated with a particular population. Okay. So let's just keep that in mind. Every population has a whole set of parameters that that describes its distribution. Okay. And at this stage, we're just interested in the measure of center associated with that particular population, the mean value. And the mean is symbolized uh, by the symbol by the symbol mu. So, how the hell are we going to get access to that particular value? Yeah. Now, typically, what we would do is we'd randomly sample. Yeah. So, what we'll do is we'll randomly, so random, randomly, yeah, we randomly sample from the population. Okay. Which gives us a smaller data set. Okay. And with respect to this smaller data set, that smaller data set has a whole set of statistics this time is associated with it. It has its own measure. Hi. Hi. Nakshimi. Sorry, guys. We can't hear you. No, you you can't hear me. Okay, sorry. Maybe what I should have done is I should have just gone straight into into in, into into YouTube. Yeah. 
Uh, guys, is everybody on YouTube? Okay. Can you? I've got 12 people listed on YouTube there. Yeah. Uh, can you just say hi if that's okay? But can you say hi through the YouTube chat? Is that okay? Okay. Okay, brilliant, brilliant, excellent, excellent. Okay. Okay. Okay, that's great. Okay, so I have mo I have most of you there now, okay, on the on the on the YouTube chat. So you can obviously hear me there. Brilliant. So I'm just gonna run through the and uh, uh, my apologies for not being able to pronounce the names. Ed Abdul uh, Raham Rahman uh, Shilan uh, Valentina uh, Dara uh, Karen uh, Vishal Stelios uh, and uh, Palavi uh, Kili eighty nine. Okay, so there's a there's a fair fourteen of you about there now at this stage. So let me just start this again, and then hopefully I can just get I can we can just get up to where we need where we need to be, which is in relation to confidence intervals. And if you've just joined me, what I've been talking about is this. And what I always go try to go back to is that we always have some particular population that we're interested in. OK, so there's some population and we're interested in understanding the characteristics associated with that population. Technically, what we say is that we're interested in understanding the distribution associated with the population. And there's many ways that we can define the distribution. And there's many parameters that define the distribution. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's like a guy that goes out to get a suit, yeah, for a wedding. There's many different parameters that the tailor is going to have to measure so that the suit actually fits the individual, okay? Uh, so a population itself has many parameters associated with it. It has its usual measures of centers, the mean, the median, the mode. It has its measures of dispersion, the variances, the standard deviations, the range. Uh, it has measures of skewness and kurtosis. Uh, and depending on the many variables where we're looking at and the relationships between them, there's different coefficients and there's correlations and so on and so forth. But the point I'm trying to make is this is let's just concentrate on trying to understand the mean uh, of a particular population. And we could we could understand it. OK, so, so we could. We, OK, so I can actually hear you as guys there. So if you're asking a question, you're probably talking among yourselves. <laughs> I don't know how to mute that there. I'll mute that there. I'll just see here. Yeah. I'll just mute that. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, so with respect to that population, what we're going to do is we're going to randomly sample from the population itself. And once we randomly sample, what we end up with is we end up with characteristics associated with sample. Sample statistics, things like X bar, things like s squared things like s and so on and so forth x bar being the sample mean okay uh, s squared being the sample variance okay uh, s being the sample standard deviation okay sample standard uh, deviation okay and to be honest with you in the real world we wouldn't just take one sample we would take lots of samples from the population okay and effectively, what we're trying to build is if we take lots of samples, for each sample now, we have an X bar. And from them, that collection of X bars, from that collection of means, we build what's known as we build the sampling distribution, okay? The sampling distribution. Okay? Uh, and that sampling distribution is going to allow us to understand the population, okay? But let's just once again keep it simple. And let's assume that what we've done is that we've randomly selected a single sample from the population. And what we have captured from that particular sample is we've measured its mean value. And we've also measured its variance stroke standard deviation. So we have X bar and we also have S. And also, sorry, we also have N, uh, the sample size. Okay? So the question now is this, is that from a variable perspective, this is our variable, okay? okay. Uh, the population itself, the population mean, okay, has to reside somewhere on this particular continuum, okay? It's either out here towards negative infinity or it's out here towards positive infinity or it's somewhere in between, yeah? Because we're dealing with typically continuous variables, okay? 
So what we can say for certain is that the population, the real population mean, the real mean must be somewhere on this continuum. Is that okay, guys? Okay. So how can this, how can this sample mean and this sample standard deviation stroke variant uh, help us to pinpoint down where that population mean might reside? Okay. And the way we do that is we do that with confidence intervals. Yeah. And there's a particular formula for confidence interval, yeah? And I'll just write down the formula here. The formula looks like this. It's X bar, okay, minus T, I'll just say T, I won't make it any more complicated, multiplied by S over the square root of N. And that's just a value this is, yeah, okay? We know what X bar is because we randomly sampled. We have our data, so we can calculate the mean. We know what S is. Once again, we have our sample data, so we can calculate the standard deviation. We know what the sample size is, n. So we've no problem in calculating this thing other than t. And I'll explain what t is now in a moment. t is just a scaling factor that's going to be associated with the size of the confidence interval that we want to build. But what we know, and I'm not doing the mathematical proof of this, yeah, but what we know is that this quantity here is a lower bound for the population mean. And then also the quantity x bar plus t times s over the square root of n, yeah, is an upper bound, okay? So, Shilan, what we're trying to do now is this, is that we're trying to bound below and also bound above with two numbers. So we get a lower bound number, we get an upper bound number, okay? And what we'd like to be able to say with respect to them two numbers is that we have a certain amount of confidence that the real population mean, okay, will actually be between those two numbers, okay? So, for example, if we build, if we want to build, it depends on how much confidence you want to have in this particular interval, yeah? Okay. But let's say for argument's sake, let's say for argument's sake that uh, we want to build a 95% confidence interval, okay? So let's say a 95% confidence interval. What the hell does that mean? All it means is that when we calculate the lower bound and when we calculate the upper bound, that we're 95% confident, okay? Here's the lower bound here, the lower. Here's the upper bound. That, <coughs> excuse me, that we're 95% confident that the true population mean, mu, can, will be found within that interval, okay? So we're 95% confident about that. But, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> you have to be careful coughing nowadays, yeah? Okay. Uh, I, uh, it's a smoker's cough, I hope. <laughs> And uh, so this 95% confidence interval that's, that's demarcated by a lower and upper bound, what that says to us is this, is that we'll have 95% confidence that the true population mean will be within that particular region, okay? But with that said, we've got 5% of unaccounted for confidence, yeah? Which makes perfect sense. So what the other 5% uh, uh, represents is that the population mean might not be in there, it might actually be above the upper bound or it might actually be below the lower bound, okay? We don't know where the hell, where the hell it is, yeah? And, uh, you know, this is once again the thing, the thing about, uh, you know, uh, sort of when you roll a dice, yeah? You know, it's possible that you roll a dice and you never get a six for a very, very long time, yeah? So it is possible that when we take a particular sample and that when we build this particular confidence interval, with the lower bound and the upper bound, it is possible that the actual true population mean isn't in there and actually is actually outside of those particular bounds, yeah? Okay. But what this particular theory allows us to do is that as we build up the evidence, as we increase the size of the sample, yeah, okay, what that allows us to do is to be, to be I suppose, is to be, I suppose I can't really say confident, yeah? is to be more sure, yeah, is that the that the population mean will actually be within the region that we've just specified. But we always have to keep in mind that it might not be there. It might be outside of that particular region. But the key thing is that when we build these confidence intervals, we can say we're a certain level of confidence with respect to where we believe the population mean would reside. Okay? And let me do an example of how to construct these things. Yeah. So let's say for argument's sake, right? So there's a little bit of work involved in this because we have to calculate. So let, yeah, let me calculate the mean and the standard deviation as well from fresh, yeah? Okay. So let's say for argument's sake that uh, we are interested, we are interested in uh, 
the spending behavior, the spending behavior of Irish citizens, yeah, okay? of our or of, of students, yeah, okay? let's keep that, okay, and we randomly sample, we randomly sample, uh, let's say keep it simple, let's say we randomly sample five students, okay, and ask, and ask how much do they spend, ask how much do they typically spend, okay? And what we got was something like this. So this is how much they typically spend over the weekend. The first person says, let's say uh, 75 euros. The next person said 62. The next person said uh, 83. The next person said 105. The next person says, let's say uh, 40, just, just for argument's sake, okay? So this is our sample, okay? That's all we have sight of. And what we need to do is we need to calculate the sample's characteristics. So we need to calculate the sample mean, we need to cal calculate the sample standard deviation, and we need to calculate the sample stand, uh, size. The size is straightforward. It's simply equal to five. Okay? The mean is relatively straightforward. It's the sum of those values divided by how many observations there are. So it's 75 plus 62 plus 83 plus 105 plus 40. Okay? And when I divide that, so that's equal to a 365. And when I divide that by five, I get a mean value of 73. Okay. So what we know is that the average spend of this particular sample is 73 euros. And there was five observations. So the question now that I have is we need to calculate what a standard deviation is. So let's have a look at the standard deviation. So I'm just going to construct a table here. I'm going to list these values down. These are my X values, my observations, 75, 62, 83. 105 and 40. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the standard deviation for these. And the standard deviation is the square root of the sum of squares all over the sample size minus one. Let me maybe write that down here. So it's the square root of the sum of squares, the x minus the x bar squared all over n minus one. And that's equal to that's equal to s, the, the, the standard the standard deviation. Okay? So that's what we need to calculate. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate here x minus x bar squared for each one of those observations. Then I'm going to sum up this column to give me this summation of the x minus the x bar squared values. Okay? So I'll do this on the calculator. Uh, so the mean is 73. So the first observation is 75. 75 minus 73 gives me 2. Okay? 2 squared gives me, gives me 4. Okay? The next one is 62. 62 minus 73 is going to give us 11, and 11 squared is going to give us 121. Then we have 83, 83 minus 73. The previous one was negative, but the square root of it is actually going to give us positive, yeah? Okay. Uh, we have 83 minus 73 gives us 10, 10 squared gives us 100. Uh, we have 105 minus 73. Uh, gives us a value of 32. And when we square that, we get a value of 1,024. And then we have 40 minus 73 gives us minus 43. 43 squared gives us a value of 1,089. Right? So the sum of squares here is 1,089 plus 1,024 plus 100 plus 121 plus 4 gives us a value of 2,338. 2, that is my sum of squares, yeah, okay? So that is the sum of the x minus the x bar squares. So what I now have is my standard deviation is going to be that summation, 2, 3, 3, 8, divided by the sample size, which is 5 minus 1, and it's the square root of that. So I'll just do that in one go. So what we end up with is the square root of 2, 3, 3, 8, divided by 4, gives us a value of, it's approximately 24. Let's keep these as whole numbers, yeah, okay? So it's approximately equal to 24. So, uh, so Shilan, what I'm saying now is this, is I'm trying to understand a population in general, and in particular, I'm trying to understand the average spending behavior of that population. And what I've done is I've randomly selected from the population five observations randomly. And what I know with respect to that sample, I do know its characteristics. And its characteristics are that its average is 73 euros, its standard deviation is 24 euros, and the sample size was equal to five. Okay. So what we'd like to do now is we'd like to use that information, yeah, okay, 
to put a bound a bound a lower bound and an upper bound around the around the true population mean okay and as i said on the previous page the formula looks like this it's x bar minus t times s over the square root of n is less than mu which is less than x bar plus t times s over the square root of n okay so we have most of the stuff here the only thing that we're missing is this t value here and this one over here it's negative over here and it's positive over here okay now what we know is this is that the sample mean is has a particular different the sample mean the distribution of the sample mean has a particular distribution associated with it and actually it follows what's known as a student's t distribution okay so if we look at the t distribution itself yeah the question that we're asking is can we find a lower t value a critical value and an upper t value a critical value that has 95 percent of the area because i want to build a 95 percent confidence interval i should have actually said that so let's construct okay a 95 percent confidence interval okay confidence interval and the most important thing to go with this statement is construct a 95 percent confidence interval for the true population population mean value okay the mean okay so depending on the size of the interval it doesn't have to be 95 percent if you want to be more confident you can construct a 98 percent one a 99 percent one a 99.9999 percent one okay and we'll have a look at that in a moment what actually happens to the interval the way the intervals change in size when you put more confidence in or when you reduce your confidence yeah uh, but at every confidence level there's a specific t value that's associated with it okay so what we're going to do is this is because the x bar is distributed based on a t distribution we're going to look at the t distribution itself okay and what i want to do is so this is the t distribution for for our true uh, for the for the, the sampling distribution and the true population mean is somewhere along here as well okay so what we're going to do now is this is that we're going to try to find a lower bound and an upper bound such that the area between them okay is 95 percent effectively okay uh, so if the area between these and this is a symmetrical distribution if the area between these two values has to be 95 percent that means 2.5 percent of the area is in that tail and 2.5 of the leftover area must be in that tail okay now we've got a set of tables that allows us to figure out these critical values here and here okay for the t distribution tables okay i'm assuming you're working on the blue book uh it could be the red one uh but whichever one you're, you're using i'll just use the blue one here for the moment yeah okay uh, and i'm just going to go to page on here it's page 22 and what we effectively have is we have where am i going to we have this is for the students t distribution okay and the way this is set up is the tables have a leading row and a number of columns okay so the leading row here is the area you've placed in your right hand tail okay, okay. now because we're building a 95 percent confidence interval i'm going to have 2.5 percent in my right hand tail and 2.5 percent in my left hand tail so the area in my right hand tail is 0 0.025 okay uh, and then what we have is listed down here is the degrees of freedom associated with this particular distribution the degrees of freedom is based off the sample size okay and more importantly how we actually calculate the standard deviation which is n minus one okay so our sample is of size five so n minus one the degrees of freedom is n minus one is going to be four so if i triangulate in here what i end up with getting is now you can't really see that i'm sure because it's very small but i'm under the column that has p is equal to 0 0.025 and i'm coming down to the row which has degrees of freedom four and i get 2.776 2.776 so effectively what that's saying is this is that with respect to t values okay that the t value of 2.776 and the symmetry minus 2.776 okay that where that there's 95 percent of the area between those two values okay now what we're going to do is we're going to use those two values in here the negative one here 
Now, we actually just put in the positive value, okay? Because the negative sign here is capturing this negative value here, okay? So we put in this value here in here, which becomes minus 2.776. And we put it in here, which becomes plus 2.776. So in this situation here, what we have effectively constructed is something like this. Let me write this down again. So a 95% CI confidence interval okay, in this scenario. As I said, it's X bar minus T times S over the square root of N is less than mu is less than X bar plus T times S over the square root of N. It now becomes 73 minus 2.776 times S, which is 24, which needs to be divided by the square root of five. Okay? That must be less than mu, which must be less than, well, X bar is 73 plus 2.776 times 24 over the square root of five. Okay. You can see that this is a common factor over here. So let's just actually do that, okay, or a common term. So I'm just gonna calculate uh, 2.776 times 24, and I'm dividing that by the square root of five, which gives me a value of 29.79. So it gives me a value of, I'll just put it into one decimal place, about 29.8. So this now becomes 73 minus 29.8 must be less than mu, which must be less than 73 plus 29.8, okay? So over here, when I got 73 minus 29.8, that gives me a value of 43.2, must be less than mu, which must be less than, and over here, um, we end up with a value of 73 plus 29.8 is gonna give us a value of 102.8, okay? So a lot, a bit of work there. D to be honest with you, the hard part is probably calculating the standard deviation, yeah? Okay? Uh, conceptually, there's a little bit more going on under the hood, of course, okay? But effectively, what we've now created is this, is that we've now put a lower bound and an upper bound on the spending behavior of this particular population, okay? So let me just draw that here. Okay? So now what we have is, this is 43.2. And this up here okay, is 102.8. 102 so what I'm saying is this, is that with respect, to the, with respect to the population that this sample has been drawn from, okay, that I would be 95% confidence that the actual spending behavior of that population is between 43 euros and 20 cents and 102 euros and 8 cents. And I'd be 95% confident in that statement, okay? But I might be wrong, yeah? That's the key thing behind it, yeah? I might be wrong, but I'll only be wrong 5% of the time, if that makes sense, yeah? Now, it could be the case that I'm wrong on my first go, okay? But who, 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 who knows, yeah? But what this is allowing us to do is it's just allowing us to place a confidence interval around the true population mean, but also to accept that, Albeit we're saying that we're confident that the true population mean resides within them, that particular interval, we actually might be wrong and actually might reside outside of that particular interval. Okay. Uh, Sheelan, uh, actually, had I got questions there? I couldn't hear if I had both Teams and YouTube open. Uh, blah, blah, blah. So everything is good here. Uh, not one for me. Okay. Uh, Sheelan, uh, does that help? This is just the first thing. I, I'm gonna construct another one, yeah, just to show you actually what happens in the real world, yeah. Okay. And this is a this is a, a really this is I think really, really nice, yeah. So what I'm gonna do is instead of me wanting to be 95% confident, yeah, I wanna be 98% confident, yeah. So I wanna be 98% confident. Uh, in other words, I want to construct a 98% confidence interval, yeah. So with respect to a 98% confidence interval, we calculate the T value that goes into this formula. And once again, we have our T distribution. So I want to be 98% confident, which means I want to find a lower bound and an upper bound that has 98% of the area in, the, in, in between those two values, which means I must be 1% over here and 1% over here, right? When I look up the T tables, the area that I have placed in the right-hand tail is 1%. So I'm gonna to go to 0.01. My degrees of freedom are still the same, they're four. And now I get a different T value. This time, where did I put that? Okay. My T value that goes along with a 98% interval is going to be 
So 0 0.01 is going to be 3.747. 3.747, okay? Which gives us, I'm just taking this formula again, x bar minus t over s over the square root of n is less than mu is less than x bar plus t times s over the square root of n. Filling in the details, okay? I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to do the calculation. So let me actually just calculate this. So it's it's 3.747 times s. Uh, s is 24, okay? Divided by the square root of 5, okay? So this factor here becomes 40.2. 40.2. So now we have that the interval will be 73 minus 40.2 must be less than mu, which must be less than 73 plus 40.2. Okay, so I just skipped the, the plugging in the values and just actually did the calculation. Okay? So now we have it must be 73 minus 40.2 gives us a value of 42.8 is less than mu. And over here then we have 40.2 uh, gives us 110. Uh, point. Sorry, am I right there? That gives us 114.2. 114.2. Okay. So, in relation to a 98% confidence interval, I'd be 98% confident that the true population mean would be between 32 euros and 80 cents and 114 euros and 2 cents. Yeah. Now, let's plot that. 32 euros and 8 cents is less than 43 euros. There you go. Okay, that's 42 and 80 cents. And 114 euros is bigger than 102 euros. That's over here. That's 114 euros and two. The red one is 98% confidence. The blue interval is 95% confidence. Okay. Okay. Now, I think the important thing to take away is this particular fact, yeah? Okay. Is that what we can actually see is this, is that when I'm less confident, okay, the interval is a lot smaller okay, than, when I'm more, than when I'm more confident. Yeah, okay? And the thing is this, this is actually, I suppose, from a, uh, this is, I suppose, let's say, that measurement problem, yeah, okay, which you've probably heard of in physics, yeah, okay? So the Heisenberg uh, uncertainty principle, yeah, in relation to particles, yeah? That if you want to know a particle's position, you can know its particle pos its position, but what you trade off is, is understanding on its momentum. If you want to understand a particle's momentum, you can understand it, but what you trade off on is knowing actually where the particle is actually positioned. Yeah? Okay? So there's this trade off, and this is a classic example of it. Yeah? Okay? Is this, is that if I want to be more confident in relation to where the population mean resides, yeah? well then my interval increases. Okay? See, this is like, let me get another pen here. This is like a classroom, yeah, okay? A classroom that's walled on the left and the right-hand side, okay? And all the students are in that classroom. And Sheelan, I'm looking for you in the classroom effectively, yeah? Okay? So once again, if I tell people to concentrate down the first couple of, let's say, the, so I'm sort of looking up into the classroom, into the theater here, and these are seat positions. And if I ask people to concentrate in that seat in, within there, we know you're in the room, okay? Like the true population mean is in the room, yeah? Okay? But it could be anywhere. Now, if I say to you to concentrate in a smaller interval, yeah, okay? okay? Well, you, you see I'm trading off that you, you're, you, could be, you could be found in actually another area of the room that's actually quite large, yeah? Okay? But if I increase the interval, yeah? Well, you're more than likely going to be in that part of the interval, yeah? That's why my confidence has increased, yeah? There's less chance of you being in here, a smaller part of the room, if that analogy makes sense. And it probably doesn't, just doing it here on the, on, on the paper, yeah? Uh, when you're in a theatre, yeah, it's sort of, you can visualise really what's going on. But the point being this, is that if you want to be more confident in relation to the true population mean, you can be more confident in relation to it. But what you, what you uh, I suppose, let's say, what you sacrifice is the location. In other words, my interval is actually after grown in size, yeah? Okay? But because it's grown in size, it's covered more of the place where the population mean could be, and hence I've got more confidence that it could actually be in there. Okay? Does that make sense? Uh, 
Sheelan, uh, have you, is there, is there any questions? Now, okay, so I, 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 brilliant, yeah. I think the important thing is this, and, and look, Amir, I do totally accept, yeah, is that uh, I think for the vast majority of this particular class, and like, I mean, albeit it's, it's a HD, is that people have been sort of out of class for a very, very long time, and they've been at work, and now they're, 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 they're coming back and they're, they're, they're encountering this stuff. I think the first thing is just to keep in mind is that uh, the formulas, when you look at them, are very, very complicated looking, yeah? and they're very scary, yeah? But they just boil down to multiplication, division, subtraction, and a little bit of addition, if that makes sense, yeah? Okay. Conceptually, what's happening here is probably the more key piece, yeah, which is what I'm trying to, trying to reflect here in relation to the positioning that all these confidence intervals allow us to do is to put a lower bound and an upper bound on where we believe that the true population mean might reside. It doesn't mean it's in there, it just means it's more than likely going to be found in there, but it could be outside of them particular intervals, yeah? And that's what all this theory is all about. Uh, now, we don't have to just do confidence intervals for population means. We can build a confidence interval around, where's that page gone to? Let me go back here. Let me go back to the start. We can build a confidence interval around any population parameter, okay? Uh, and the formulas just change a little bit. Uh, excuse me. The formulas just change around a little bit, yeah? Uh, the maths associated with how you get to the formulas is probably a little bit more complicated because you have to construct the sampling distribution of the particular parameter that, you, that, yeah, that, that you're looking at uh, or the statistic associated with that particular parameter, yeah? Uh, but they're just the formulas. But we can actually do confidence interval for means. We can do a confidence interval for the population variance or standard deviation. You can do one for its skewness or its kurtosis and so on. <clears throat> and so forth, if that makes sense, yeah. Uh, I'm assuming that the only thing that he's done at this stage is a confidence interval for the population mean. Has he has he done any other confidence intervals? Anybody, any ideas? Has he looked at the co a confidence interval for a population proportion or anything like that at this stage? Okay, maybe he hasn't. Okay, that's 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 okay. Uh, the other thing about this particular interval is that we're using the student's t distribution. Okay, so I mean things like in relation to the sample size, uh, in relation to the standard deviation, you can see that we're using the sample standard deviation here. When we have the actual population standard deviation, we can use a z distribution to actually calculate these particular bounds. The formula changes, the formula becomes x bar minus z times sigma over the square root of n is less than mu, is less than x bar plus z times sigma over the square root of n. Now, the only thing, the only two things have changed here, yeah? What I'm saying is this, is that even though we have our sample data, uh, we could calculate the sample standard deviation from that particular data, yeah? But the sample standard deviation is, is only an estimate, it, albeit it's unbiased, it's still only an estimate of the population standard deviation. So imagine the situation where we actually know the population standard deviation. Well, if you know the population standard deviation, why don't we use that? That's a perfect estimate of itself, if that makes sense, yeah? So what we could do, but once we know the population standard deviation, the distribution changes to the standard normal distribution, yeah? And what we do is that we actually calculate uh, the 95, the 90% intervals, and uh, we actually calculate Z scores that go along with them, yeah? Which just uses the Z tables. But the same thing again is that you're looking for 95% of the area to be between certain values or 90%, depending on the size of the interval uh, that, 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 was, that was calculated, okay? Uh, okay. God, this this video is actually being recorded here, so I have to download it off this and then and then upload it again onto YouTube. So it will be available later on this evening uh, for you guys if you just want to reflect back over this. Uh, I think it's sort of coming. It's coming up now to six o'clock. 
Uh, I do have another session uh, later on, and I probably need to sort of get set up for that, unless unless there are any more questions uh, or there's anything that's a little bit muddy in relation to what I've, what I've, what I've done there. Uh, sorry, there's Karin. Uh, do you mind uh, to explain how to get the T score again? I understood there are one percent for each side. Okay, so let's have a look at that again. So, and that's, I suppose, the key thing is that once you have the sample statistics, uh, what we're really looking for. Where do I put my pens? Here they are. Here. Mm -hmm. But once you have the sample statistics, you have X bar, you have S, and you have N, okay? The only thing that's required in the formula is that T value, okay? So it is the key piece in relation to the calculation. Uh, so X bar plus T times S over the square root of N. And once we know, because that's, that's, the, that's the only missing piece of information. So once we know that, we can actually calculate the lower bound and the upper bound, and it just files back down to elementary arithmetic if that makes sense yeah uh, so uh kareen it depends on the size of the confidence interval that you want to construct okay so let me construct a different confidence interval okay let me construct let's say i want to construct a 90 percent confidence interval okay which effectively means i'd like to construct a lower bound and an upper bound and that I'm 90% confident that the true population mean will reside between those two values. Okay? So what I need to do is I need to calculate the appropriate T value that's associated with a 90% confidence interval. So let's just draw that geometrically. Let's just draw our distribution. This is our T distribution. All the T scores are along here. And depending on the T score, there's a certain amount of area under the curve uh, to the left-hand side or to the right-hand side of that T score. So what we're looking for is we're trying to find a lower bound and an upper bound so that 90% of the area is between, is between those two bounds. Okay? So, Corrine, this is the important point here. Yeah, um, If there's 90%, if we require 90% of the area to be between these two bounds, this is a symmetric distribution. So that means the tails must account for 10% of the area, which means... 5% of the area must be in this tail over here, and 5% of the area must be in this tail over here. Okay? Now, we've got a set of t-tables that allows us to calculate or to identify t-values that have certain amount of areas to the right-hand side of them. And actually, we've set this up in just in relation to the t-tables. It's the amount of the area in the right-hand tail. So we've placed... <coughs> sorry. We've placed 5% of the area in the right-hand tail here. So I'm going to go to the t-tables. And I'm going to go to the column that says 0 0.05. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. And also what we have is we have our degrees of freedom, which in relation to a, a t distribution, okay, the degrees of freedom is equal to n minus 1. It's equal to the sample size minus 1. Okay? When we have a single sample that's being selected. Yeah. Okay. So n minus 1, our sample size in the previous example was 5. So 5 minus 1 gives us 4. That's our degrees of freedom. So now I'm going to look at the tables on row 4, the row labeled 4, under the column 0 0.05. Excuse me. Sorry, guys. And what I end up with is, you can't really see them here. Maybe I'll just turn this light on here. I don't know whether that will help. Yeah. Maybe it did. Maybe it didn't. Uh, let me... I'll go up a little bit closer. I'll come over here, I think. Yeah. So I'm coming under the column 0 0.05. There it is there. And I'm coming down to the row 4, which gives me, it seems like 2.132. 2.132. So that's the T value that's going to plug in here. And it's going to plug in here, along with the X bar, the S and the N that you've already calculated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Let's say I want to calculate, uh, let's say, an 80% confidence interval. Well, once again, what we have now is, these are T values. We want 80% of the area to be between, be between these two values. 
So if 80% of the area is between those two values, it means that the tails, the tails themselves must account for 10% each. Okay? That's the remaining 20%. So how much area is in my right-hand tail? In my right-hand tail, in my right-hand tail, there's 10%. So I'm going to go to the tables where we have 10% is 0 0.1, four degrees of freedom. And now I get the associated T-score that goes with 80% confidence. And in our case here, the T-score is 1.533, 1 1.533, right? Um, if I want to be, let's say, bum, 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 if I want to be 99% confident, 99% confident, okay, for argument's sake, that's how far our tables will allow us to go. Well, that means I want to have 99% of the area between these two points, okay? 99%, which means the tails must account for 1%, which means that 0.5% must be over here and 0.5% must be over here, okay? 0.5% as a decimal is 0 0.005. So I'm gonna to go to the tables. I'm looking up how much area is in my right-hand tail is 0 0.05. My degrees of freedom in this example is four. So I get a T value. I get a T value here of, if I'm not mistaken, 4.604. Okay, uh, and that's the T value now that I use to construct a 99% confidence interval. Uh, okay, sorry, okay, sorry, I should have looked at that post there. Yeah, I'm just going to just reflect back there for a moment. Uh, there was a post here by Kareen who said, uh, oh, sorry, by, yeah, by Kareen, the 3.747. Let me actually just find that number. The 3.747. Where is it gone? Three points. Oh, the three point seven four seven. Yeah. Okay. It is the T value. Okay, and that's exactly what I've gone through. There is for that particular T value, we want ninety eight percent confidence, which means one percent is in both tails. In particular, one percent is in the right hand tail. That's one percent as a decimal is zero point zero one. The sample size is five. The degrees of freedom is four, which gives us three point seven four seven, and that's the T value that we use for a ninety eight percent confidence interval. Actually, guys, the thing about it is, is this, is that them T values don't change, okay? So yeah, you can either just have in your mind a list of the T values that go along with certain intervals, but the only thing is that if you don't know how to calculate them, if you change the interval size, yeah, it can cause it can cause uh, a few problems, yeah? Yeah. But there you go. I'm just going to just reflect down through these chats here. Uh, when I use T-score and Z-score, thank you, Palavi, hi when to use T-score and Z-scores, okay? And I sort of mentioned that a moment ago. Uh, you'll be able to reflect back through this video because it is going to be recorded, yeah, okay? So let me just go back here. Where is that gone to? Uh, I'm just going to try to find the sheet that I had a moment ago. Okay. Hey, guys. What did I do? Did I throw it away? No. Mm -hmm. uh, so just one second, please. So let me get rid of that. And there, oh, yeah, here it is. Here, yeah, okay, right. So, the question once again is when to use T and when to use Z, yeah, okay. Uh, now, there's a few different rules here, yeah, okay. The T distribution is set up, the T distribution is a whole family of distributions, yeah, it's a distribution that's associated with every single sample size, okay. So, it doesn't matter about the sample size when it comes to the T distribution, yeah, okay. Uh, you can go along and you can use it. You can use the t-distribution in any case. And actually, all the modern statistical packages always give you back t-values. Yeah. Okay? Now, the difference between these conceptually is this, is that the t-distribution, yeah, is, is we're using, well, this confidence interval here, yeah, okay, is the confidence interval for a population mean when we don't know the population standard deviation. In other words, and we estimate it using the unbiased estimate which is the sample standard deviation, okay? So that's the first thing. That's the first reason why we go for this one over this one here. When you do know the population standard deviation, okay? So when you do know that, let me just turn that off there, okay? Oh, can that focus in there? Maybe I'll just try that again. 
not to lose in that. Right, guys, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I'll tell you, there's just a camera there now. So the camera is after going a bit thing. It'll, I'll, I'll, it's getting in there now, yeah. So let me just zoom, let me just focus that a bit. Okay, there we go. Okay. Brilliant. Okay, so when to use Z and when to use T? Well, clearly the difference between both formulas is that one has a sigma in it, a population standard deviation, and the other one has an S in it, a sample standard deviation. So the first rule is this, is that when you're given the population standard deviation, we'll go with the Z. When you're not given the population standard deviation, we'll go with the T. Does that make sense? Another rule of thumb is in relation to the sample size, okay? Now, there are, and I can see that there's, uh, uh, let's see, Vishal, hi, so what happens if the sample size is 20 or more, okay? Now, there's a thing called the central limit theorem, uh, that tells us as the sampling size increases, okay, that the sampling the sampling distribution okay, associated with the sample mean tends to normality, okay, as the sample sizes increase. And when we take more and more samples of a larger and larger size, okay. So in that situation, yeah, okay, we can we can assume that the curve is normally distributed, yeah, okay. Uh, and in particular, standard normally distributed, and we go with the Z, yeah? Okay? When we have a large sample size, okay? Now, with that said, the question is, what's the demarcation point between large and small sample size? Now, most of the text that you pull down off the shelf, okay? Uh, most of the text that you pull down off the shelf would say that sample sizes of 20 or above are good, sample sizes of 30 or above are good, but what I'd be actually saying is this, is that, to be honest with you, there's other stuff that we're trading off against here, which is the power associated with the test, yeah? So it depends. It depends on the size of the effect that we're trying to measure. It depends on many different things. And actually, technically, every single test that we should, that we want to undertake, yeah? Okay? That what we should do beforehand is what's known as a power analysis. And that power analysis will tell us the appropriate sample size that we should use to be able to achieve a certain level of power and confidence with respect to our experiment, okay? And then you have the cutoff point, okay? It might not be 20, it might not be 30, it could be 120, yeah, okay? Uh, but the cutoff point then would be that anything below it is a small sample and anything above it is a large sample, if that makes sense, yeah, okay? But typically, as the sample size increases, yeah, okay, we can go with the Z, and also when the population standard deviation is known, when we don't know the population standard deviation and we're going to estimate it, which with the unbiased uh, estimate uh, of S, well, then we can go with the T distribution. Okay, guys? Uh, I really do hope that, that that helped you out. I'm just conscious of the time here now. Yeah, it is ticking away there. And I do have, an, I do have another session to try to get up and running. Uh, so maybe if there's any more questions, uh, I think what I'll do is... I think what I'll, I'll do is leave it there and actually thank uh, so many of you for joining it. It was 17, 18, like, it was around, I think it peaked around 20 actually on one stage. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is that okay, guys? I'm just going back over to Teams now uh, to see whether there's anybody there that wants to ask any, any, any more questions. Yeah. Uh, Sheelan, is that okay for you? Uh, Pamela, was that helpful? Yeah, that was really helpful. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Sheila. Yeah. Okay. So, will we, will will we go then? Will we just will we continue at this particular time every Wednesday? What I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to schedule another session now for next Wednesday. So hopefully tomorrow evening when you when you're in class with Vladimir, uh, you will have a you'll have a better understanding in relation to what the alternative assessment is actually going to look like. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll tailor support specifically towards that. Uh, I am also conscious as well, uh, uh, Valentina, that you did ask the question in relation to probability in general, as in the, I think it was the addition rule and the multiplication rule and things like that. I think what I'll also do is I'll actually, 
I'll actually just set up a, a live stream, uh, a live stream, or I might actually point you in relation to one of my, one of my sets of my playlists. Yeah. Let, let me, let me just think about that. Uh, so I will have to cover something on probability at some stage as well. Yeah. In relation to the, the, the foundational probability concepts. Okay. Is that okay, guys? So can I, can I end this now? Yes, thanks. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay, guys, thanks very much. Okay, for joining in, and I'll talk to you soon. Okay, I'm just gonna hit end on this now, and I'm going to hit end on the recording as well. So I'm gonna just end the stream over here as well. So I'm gonna end that stream, okay, and I do want to end. Brilliant.